Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, if you haven't yet, please go ahead and answer the poll questions that popped up on your screen. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Just really briefly before we dive in, I have a quick um, programming note. Today's event is available to listen to in either English or French. So you should see a small button at the bottom of your screen that says interpretation with a globe. You can go ahead and click on that and select the language of your choice, either English or French. Um, je vais dire bienvenue à nos collègues francophones. Heureusement, nous aurons um, l'occasion de vous présenter cette séance en français. Si vous voyez un bouton en bas de votre écran uh, qui dit interprétation, Vous pouvez appuyer sur le, le globe ou la sphère et choisir le français. Comme ça, vous allez rentrer dans la chaîne français. All right. Give everyone just a second to select their language. Va vous donner une minute de choisir la langue. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I would love to start us off by introducing the fantastic lineup of speakers that we have for you today. We are very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to hear from Prasi Muyungo, a powerful community health worker and community health worker advocate from Uganda. We have Judy Macharia from the Nairobi Metropolitan Services in Kenya, where they just launched the new Community Health Services Act, providing a legal framework for pay. So very excited to hear from Judy in a few minutes. We have Dr. George Upento from Uganda, who is the director of the um, Department of Community Health with the Ministry of Health in Uganda. We have, of course, our fearless leader, Dr. Madeline Ballard of the Community Health Impact Coalition. Nelly Wakaba is joining us from the Financing Alliance for Health. Um, so I just wanna mention before we get started that we will have time for question and answer at the end of today's session. So if you could please note down your questions throughout, uh, we will have time to answer them at the end. I also invite you to type your questions in the chat. Um, you can go ahead and do that throughout the event and we will either try to answer them in real time if we can or we'll collect them and respond to them at the end of the session. So please do um, feel free to type your questions in the chat. And with that, I am excited to introduce the topic that we are all here to talk about today. As we know, community health workers are the backbone of a strong primary health care system. We have seen this be absolutely critical right now during this global pandemic that we are all in. We have two global bodies recommending, making critical recommendations that community health workers be fairly paid for their work. The WHO recommends that community health workers receive a financial package commensurate with the demands, complexity, hours, training, and roles of their jobs. And we have the International Labor Organization recommending that community health worker pay reflect their qualifications, responsibilities, duties, and experience. Yet we know that this is not the reality on the ground. In fact, community health workers are frequently undertrained, under resourced and underpaid or not paid at all for their essential work. We all acknowledge that this is not acceptable and this is what we're here to talk about today. You know, there are a lot of reasons or a lot of justifications given for this inequity. But one thing that we know is that not paying community health workers is simply not sustainable. And so while we have this moral imperative to pay community health workers, it is a big challenge. There are real obstacles to figuring out how to implement the systems that can ensure that community health workers are fairly remunerated and effectively paid for their services. 
And so for that reason, we were thrilled to partner with Trust Law to undertake this important body of resource uh, of research, excuse me, to help equip all of you, the decision makers, with the tools you need to help make this moral imperative a reality. So with that, I am thrilled to turn it over to Prasi Myungo, community health worker from Uganda, who's gonna share more about how community health worker advocates are coming together to call for fair remuneration. Over to you, Prasi. Community health workers are trusted providers of primary health care in communities around the world. Now, we CHWs are joined to advocate for the health system support we need and deserve. In this way, I mean, we belong to World Health Organization. We receive the health services they need without suffering financial hardships. CHWs will save life. We have been on the front line responding to COVID-19 worldwide. In this, I mean, we belong to World Health Organization. With the Ministry of Health in Uganda, we support where it's not work where it can't reach. That's why in Uganda, we are titled Health Center One. The bad thing, they don't bother about us, though they know that we work with them because the government started the program in 2001. In the effort to address the high disease burden and the critical shortage of healthy professionals, as well as improve equitable access to healthy services. We are lay, we CHWs, we are lay persons with the ability to read and write prefer in our local language. During pandemic, the world used the CHWs as it has been never been before. We, I realized this in our WhatsApp group, which helps us to communicate and it's all of our difficulties worldwide. Everywhere, everyone was talking about when we are given limited DPPEs. A lot of posters to be distributed to our communities to help the community to follow SOPs as Minister of Health guidelines, whereby we told the community how to wash hands and wearing masks as COVID-19 preventive measures. We worked tirelessly to, to mystify rumors about COVID-19. And now we are counseling them about the new COVID-19 vaccine, vaccination. I keep on asking myself, is the government to see our work? Do they appreciate? What are they talking about our work? Or why are they taking our work for granted? Though the large number of us are women, but the thing I realize is that some of us, we are not financially stable. We need to support our families and change the living. One example is me. I'm a woman working in a saloon. That's a hairdresser somewhere. I'm holding three kids. Whereby one of them is a sickler. So we have, I have to buy medicine for, for my son to survive and so on. So if they, if they decide and give us salary and other benefits, we can help the world to hit the, their target. That was healthy for all. Universal health care, which they failed because that goal was to, to, to be heated in 2000. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Prose Miingo, a community health worker in Uganda, working in Mitiana, supported by Living Goods.
Community health workers are trusted providers of primary health care in communities around the world. Now, we CHWs are joining together to advocate for the health system support we need and deserve. Community health workers are the backbone of the health system across the world. In during pandemic, we do a lot and we are the people do that there. We as CHWs, we are the ground, we are on the ground doing so many things. We also need to be motivated like any other workers. We are working hard in the communities and we are very close to the people. As community health workers, we deserve privileges as other health workers, like monthly salary, health insurance. Get some pay, we provide support for our families and address all our financial problems. I believe we deserve health insurance and support just like other health workers. CHW need to be paid salary or stipend because we are doing major work in the community. I advocate for fellow CHWs to be paid salary or stipend consistently. I want request the government to pay community health workers. I request all community health workers to be paid fair salary. Due to our work how we do, door to door, we assess and treat and fight. I support the hashtag pay community health workers campaign. Let's ensure more community health workers are fairly paid. Thank you, Prasi. Thank you for sharing the, the video um, that you and your colleagues put together and um, your own story. As I think both Prasi and Jenny made clear, um, community health workers, despite the clearly life-saving work that they perform, have long been subject to a sort of global debate uh, about their remuneration. And I think as Prasi put it best, you know, the debate is over. It's fundamentally exploitative to expect the poor to volunteer as a condition of achieving their own right to health. And luckily, uh, new research on how countries are institutionalizing CHW payment can help us as policymakers, as advocates, meet these CHW demands for recognition and for fair working conditions. So over the next um, five or six minutes, I'm going to give a brief overview of these data in two parts. One, uh, introducing common approaches to CHW compensation that have been taken by countries who are already doing this now, and we have some policymakers with us on this webinar. And two, considering the advantages and disadvantages of each of these approaches to CHW payment, because I think what we realize is not all forms of payment are equal, uh, and we want to look at it from the perspective of the health system and of CHWs themselves. And I should mention again that this research was undertaken uh, by the Community Health Impact Coalition in partnership with Trust Law, which is the Thomson Reuters Foundation's legal pro bono service. And we are very grateful uh, to the law firms on the screen for their substantial contributions to this process, again, across five different countries. So this study uh, maps five examples of approaches to CHW payment. Again, considering the ways in which legal frameworks that underpin these models adhere or not to the WHO guidance on remuneration. Uh, and what is that guidance? It can basically be summarized as pay commensurate with the work undertaken. Um, so we know, for example, in Rwanda, CHWs treat half of all malaria cases. Prasi just gave you a rundown of all the responsibilities she takes on in addition to other paid work uh, in her community. And so uh, the five countries that we looked at were Brazil, Ghana, Nigeria, Rwanda, and South Africa. And these countries, why these countries? They were chosen in answer to the question, what grouping of countries might best illustrate a diversity of common approaches to CHTB compensation? And so uh, together with these law firms, we reviewed the regulatory framework governing CHTB compensation in each of these countries. Um, and uh, try to kind of create uniform country profiles using a standardized set of questions uh, in order to clearly map uh, legal requirements for CHW compensation in each country, 
uh, the compensation mechanism that was used, legal protections and benefits that were afforded as part of that mechanism, um, and then ultimately kind of arrive at some advantages and disadvantages of each model, uh, again, with respect to CHWs in terms of financial protection and also the health system in terms of ease of implementation. And so uh, here, are the, again, a little bit of a brief overview of the models in each of the five countries. Um, in Brazil, it's a public sector model. So CHWs can be hired by states uh, and they receive pay as state employed, um, as any other state employed worker. And that adheres to, to a salary floor. In Ghana, we have community health volunteers who are unpaid. In Nigeria, CHWs are regarded as non-workers under national labor legis um, legislation. And so their remuneration is determined by private employment contacts. So that's a private sector model. In Rwanda, we have a cooperative in, um, performance based incentive model where uh, BINOM are legally treated as volunteers, but they earn again these performance based incentives through income generating cooperatives. Uh, and in South Africa, we have a bit of a hybrid model, both public and private, where CHMEs are formally employed in the public sector or subcontracted through NGOs. Um, and we see the public sector CHWs here have a few more legal protections. And uh, one note before we get too far into it and before the chat box explodes, obviously in several countries, more than one community health-based uh, cadre exists. And so this paper was an attempt to examine a diversity of common approaches to CHW compensation. And so in some cases, results obviously would have varied considerably if another cadre in that same country were chosen. So for instance, an analysis of the village health uh, workers uh, or volunteer village health worker cadre in Nigeria rather than choose um, would likely return re results similar to those presented for Ghana's uh, CHVs. So um, please take a look at the cadre um, for which these data have been captured. So again, we assess these approaches in terms of uh, legal structures and requirements for CHW compensation and CHW jobs and, and demands. And you can see, uh, again, just a, a quick rundown of these various approaches. And um, it becomes really clear when we take these data and run it through uh, the WHO guideline, which is, again, remunerating CHWs with a financial package commensurate with their job demands, complexity, uh, the number of hours, training, and roles they undertake, and, and also not paying CHWs predominantly uh, according to performance-based incentives, uh, it becomes clear, and you can see this really well in the next slide, that many common CHW payment models actually don't reflect those two key recommendations. That certain approach to CHW compensation, particularly public sector or models with public sector wage floors, have institutionalized these recommended CHW protections. Uh, and this is relevant for ministries and planners, both to understand how certain approaches to institutionalizing CHW payment um, are meant to work in theory, and also, and that's what we're going to do for the remainder of this hour, dive into how they have manifested in practice. And so we've mapped implications for health systems and CHWs for each of these models above. Um, and it's clear that for both the volunteer model that we see in Ghana and the PBI model in Rwanda, uh, both pose kind of serious challenges to CHW well-being. We know that two-thirds of cooperatives in Rwanda don't actually make a profit, while simultaneously creating problems of accountability and quality control for the health system. Obviously, if you're just a volunteer, um, the health system has very little uh, leg to stand on when it comes to oversight, quality of care, and the different types of demands that one might want to make on a health worker to ensure that all patients get treated with dignity, respect, and are able to access services when they need them. We see that a mixed system um, might preserve uh, a role for non-state actors and a competitive landscape. Um, without a public sector wage floor, though, there is a risk of entrenching inequalities between public and private sector CHWs, and there was some evidence of that both in South Africa and in Nigeria. Ultimately, again, robust public sector recognition regulation compensation of CHWs gives the health workers the best protection, the best stability, and also the health system, the most clarity and accountability, again, when it comes to services delivered to rural populations and also services delivered um, uh, to vulnerable populations in cities. And so to unpack some of this and talk a little bit more about how ministries can 
diagnose where they're at uh, and how they might move further down the road towards uh, equitable compensation for CHWs. I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Nelly Wakaba of the Financing Alliance. Sorry, thank you very much, Madeline, for laying out what the paper uh, brought out. And so what I'll take us through is, what are then are the policy implications for this? And in the following slides, we are going to look at six different scenarios across two dimensions that will help us to see what does it take then to have CHWs compensated and the, the pathways that should be considered. So two main dimensions would be institu institutionalization. So to what extent? Are these community health workers recognized as official members of the health workforce? And the second thing is remuneration. Are these CHWs actually compensated for the work with which their job demands, the skills and the roles performed? So it's critical uh, to note that ensuring community health workers are recognized in a legal framework and are duly compensated actually requires sustained political will. Without political will, this cannot go anywhere. So channeling political will will actually advance one dimension, either institutionalization or remuneration, and it will be a benefit for the other um, uh, component or dimension. Next, please. So then, the strategies to advance pay up, fair pay for community health workers. I want us to look at these six scenarios, and I know we can identify with some of these scenarios from our different countries. So on the left side, where we have the red boxes, the, some countries are actually in the red. It is because community health workers are actually not recognized or nor are they paid. They're not recognized as a formal cadre in the healthcare system. And so they are not paid um, and, and, and they are not even recognized by the governments. And so here in this situation, what we would need is creating political will towards reform. Again, I must point out that the journey towards institutionalization is a process and it will take political will. Political will is indispensable. So from the left side, moving towards the, the right, we have, a, we have then community health workers who are recognized as key members of the health workforce, but they are not paid. For example, or maybe they receive some small tokens, right? For example, we have CHBs, uh, CBVs in, um, in Zambia or HD, HDA volunteers um, in Ethiopia. That's the Health Development Army. So then for us to be able to foster pathways towards professionalization, what do we need to do? is that one, we need to actually capitalize on emerging political will and mandate to reform so that at least governments have now recognized these community health workers. And then we do have partners, for example, in Uganda, um, where we have partners such as Living Goods compensating these community health workers, um, you know, giving them a stipend or, or something to be able to move along. So one of the key things that we need to do in this pathway is capitalize on that political will that is emerging, but also look at how do we professionalize these community health workers, their indemnification, professional associations, the way we select them, the way we train them, so that then we move to the right side of the spectrum where we have these community health workers institutionalized. And what does that mean? It means that now government recognizes these community health workers as part of their payroll, or actually as part of their, um, uh, their government health workers, they may not necessarily have a budget line, and that's the green box, for example, in South Africa, where there was a collective bargaining agreement, and so they were institutionalized in that regard. But then there is the highest beat that we would all aspire to move to, and that is the, the blue box, where we have the strong and sustained political will, which has community health workers who are actually having a budget line and they are on the state wage bill. A very good example, as we've seen from the paper that Madeline just shared, is Brazil, 
we do have other countries like Zambia who have a cadre called the Community Health Assistants who are on payroll, Ethiopia, and in some select Kenyan counties. So this is something we really aspire to, and we need to implement this at scale and is a best practice. But then, ladies and gentlemen, we know there are challenges to actually make this work. There are some challenges, and some of those are one in the program design. If we, if the selection of community health workers is not clear, if their entry criteria is not very clear as well, it becomes very hard to actually even have conversations of institutionalization. Why? Because how will these people be defined under the public service commission and, um, and, the, and the scheme of service, for example? So it's very critical even as we are thinking of this payment component to look at the whole ecosystem and ensure that these key design elements, such as training, the selection criteria, the entry point is very, very aligned with the scheme of service. The second thing, which is a thorny issue, is the wage bill debate. And of course, most of the governments will tell you that they have no fiscal space to accommodate these people. But then the other argument would be, you know, there is demonstrated impact and the ROI of community health workers, a return of 10 to 1 is a good investment. Secondly, we do have a huge human resources gap that I think and I believe these governments would benefit a lot from community health workers. But also, lastly, there are some innovative ways of, of financing these mechanisms. I see that, you know, in the future, in the near future, if we define our community health package services very well, they could be reimbursable by the social mechanisms, the social insurance schemes. Um, is one way of looking at it. The third challenge, which I think Madeline has even alluded to, is that in our program design, we have a myriad of types of community health workers. So even if you sit before a policymaker, they are wondering, okay, who do we actually recognize? Who do we institutionalize? Is it the CHA, the CHU, the CHV? Who is it? Just to give an example. So if countries can look at their design and really narrow down to that, community health worker and their supervisor, that will make institution recognition and in institutionalization a bit of an easier process. So I will pause uh, there. Um, next slide. And I will give Judy, uh, who we are honored to have, who has actually uh, been in this process from Nairobi County, tell us what was this process like of making that significant step of institutionalizing their community health workers. Over to you, Judy. Thank you, Nelly. Uh, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, Nairobi County, what we did is that, uh, you know, in Kenya, health is a devolved function and it is devolved in the 47 counties. So what we did is that we worked together with our county assembly. Uh, okay. So what we did is that we worked with our county assembly and our county assembly, we have members of county assembly who normally pass their motions in the county assembly. So we worked with them. Lucky for us, we had one member of county assembly or an MCA was who had interest in the work that the CHVs were doing. So as the executive, we introduced uh, the motion together with that MCA in our county assembly. And we were lucky that uh, it went all the steps from the first reading, the second reading, we had a public participation that took 21 days. And then after that, we had the third reading and then the act was passed. This act was passed in the year 2019, but you know what has happened in between. And so we delayed in gazetting it. And now this is when we just gazetted it. Um, so what, what we are doing next is that we are trying to functionalize now the act. One of the things we have said is that uh, our CHVs will be paid on performance. It will be actually performance-based stipends. And we are now trying to have a formal agreement with them. We've been registering them. Fine, they've been our CHVs, but now we are going a step further to ensure that we have their details, we have their photos, we have their... Um, 
we have their IDs and all that, so that now we can start paying them. The county assembly has allocated us around 100 million Kenyan shillings. We have uh, 7,320 community health volunteers. The money is so little, but they have promised us in the next financial year, we are going to get more. So what we have learned is to work as a team. It is all about teamwork. We've worked with our partners or our partners. We've worked together. We've worked together with the national, the national government, the county government, and we've ensured that teamwork is in place. But very critical is that uh, what we learned when introduce a motion in the county assembly as the executive, it takes time to pass. But when you allow the members themselves, the honorable members themselves to take the motion and then you support them with the technical know-how, it passes very fast. So we are grateful and you know that we are somewhere and all our 7,320 CHVs eventually will be remunerated. Thank you. Over to you, Nelly. Uh, thank you, Judy. Over to you, Kerry. Thank you, Nelly. Um, I'd like to introduce George, uh, Dr. George Apento, if you'd like to go ahead and speak next. Yeah. Uh... I want to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody on call. I am excited to be part of the exercise and the discussion. Today, um, community health workers remuneration. And, uh, and of course, as you may know, uh, our community health workers, whom we actually refer to as the village health teams, came into existence when we launched a strategy called the village health team strategy. And that was 20 years ago, like uh, Madame Prosi has highlighted for you in a presentation. And Along the way, uh, down the road, down. I saw the current lessons from other, they would pick lessons from other countries like Ethiopia and maybe come up with a new strategy. And that strategy, which they had wanted to launch, was the one they called the Community Health Extension Workers Strategy. Uh, that allowed that uh, every parish uh, in the country has like two people who would pay because the village health team strategy did not allow for payment of any person who is volunteering under that name of village health teams. And so the village, I mean, the community health extension workers uh, did not see the light of day because uh, it, was, it was not uh, favorable to the aspirations of uh, the country uh, health sector development goal. And so, uh, when we are trying to rethink how then do we uh, reinvigorate our community health workforce, COVID came in. And when COVID came in, it came at a time when we really needed the community in the health space. And so COVID being a community space, we all saw it wise that uh, we needed to bring in the community into the health space to able to raise the pandemic of COVID. And so in 2020, that was October, uh, the country launched what we call the community engagement strategy and guidelines to that effect we are developed. And uh, this strategy uh, ideally was meant to bring the community into the health space to provide the necessary workforce and human capital to try to address uh, the need for COVID response. And also in trying to bring them into the health space, there was opportunity for skill transfer for them. And, and also now uh, there was opportunity
is to, to retool them to respond to COVID. Inscribed into that strategy that uh, the village COVID task forces would have between five or more village health teams. Those are the cadres we use. Now, of these five to six uh, village health teams, we would start with one who would be purely a full-time worker because he says maybe full-time. And so uh, qualify for 100,000 Uganda shillings. That's close to like, uh, should I say $30? Oh, 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 oh. Yes, something like that uh, per month. And that was agreed and he has been uh, clearly documented in the guidelines for community engagement strategy. And that enabled payment of community health workers, the village LT, for the first time in Uganda, after 20 years of not being considered for any payment. But that's the starting point because the strategy is saying every village should have between five to six. And government is thinking if this works out well, then we may increase from one person to two persons, maybe to three persons, uh, subsequently to four, five, until we can cover the entire group of workers who are in a part to six people uh, on a monthly uh, payment. Now, we are currently trying to look at how then do we institutionalize this. We also discovered that we never have anything like a, a national community health strategy that should do actual help guide government because as community health workers and they are in the village, they have never been part of the formal national health system. And so this development of the community health strategy is ongoing and it tends to bring on board different Uh, uh, community health kind of type local community and model in which sense uh, when this parish development model takes shape um, all services that needs to be delivered to household would, would all be administered from the parish so there is going to be administrative structure at the parish level. And within every parish, they are close to 10 to 16 villages. Now this parish will look, will act like what, will, like uh, a, a, a point of service delivery to the community and to the household. So this parish model is going to allow us actually anchor and mainstream uh, the community engagement strategy inside it to enable these community health workers become part of the parish development committee. Now, as we talk now, the community engagement strategy has helped us to establish what we are looking at as the COVID task forces within every village. And within every village, there is a system of political arrangement where uh, a team of 10 to 15 people from the village COVID task force, headed by the local council one of that village with its, with its councillors. And the village health teams are part of those uh, arrangements. Now, we are talking of COVID task force in that village to try to actually respond to COVID. But we have also integrated the work which the community health workers we are doing initially before COVID into what they are doing now alongside COVID. So that going beyond COVID and after COVID, this team continues to act like health center one of government. Now, we are looking at phasing out health center twos so that now we only have health center three. 
and health center three will act like a referral point for these, uh, I mean, patients or clients who will be identified from the villages and the communities and cannot be handled at that level and will be referred to, to the health center three. And, and, and that therefore means even the kind of COVID activity we are handling now under home-based care is properly integrated into the routine services offered by these community health workers. The vision is that this village health team who are under these COVID task forces eventually become our health center one. And that's the vision. And that's the vision of how we want to institutionalize our community health workers and they become part of the formal health system. But what are Thank you, challenges? Dr. George, for sharing that vision of how the CHWs are becoming institutionalized in Uganda, particularly after a very long fight over many years. Um, yes. We're going to turn now to the questions and answers. We've had a couple of questions answered in writing um, in the Q&A box, and you can see the responses to those if you scroll over to that. Uh, we'll also take the chance now to ask some questions live to the panel. Um, one question for Prossi, uh, there are concerns that when CHWs become paid, uh, they would become stigmatized as quote, salary men or salary women who are making money off their fellow community members and lose their respect and social acceptance. Um, should that be a concern? Have you lost the respect of your community members since beginning to make a salary for your work? Uh, thank you very much. You you've asked that when we started be paying, we will we, we will we will see ourselves highly. No, it's, it won't be like that. Even we have been getting small incentives from this Nani government or organization, but we know how to use. We know how to defend our families. We know there are problems holding our families as CCHWs. So I want to say that we will feel highly or we, we will look our family down and we'll be on the top of the family. It won't be like that. We are, we, like me, I'm now 36 years. I think no one is older, young than that. We, we, we have grown enough. We know how to use. Thank you. Thank you, Prasi. Um, I have a question now uh, for Dr. Judy. If you had to give advice to other um, ministers, politicians, policymakers, uh, what advice would you, would you give them to take the first step? Many governments agree that CHWs ought to be paid, but there's often this inertia to take the first step. So a question that we have from a fellow Kenyan is, what can be done uh, to encourage um, counties to take that first step? What advice would you give people who have not yet undertaken the work that you have? Uh, it's all about working together. Number one, uh, we know that health has no mile, political milestone, but when uh, these governments, especially in Kenya, whereby we are now going to have our elections sometime next year, when they understand that the CHVs are in charge of households, and these households are the ones they expect uh, them to go and vote for them, they will support anything the CHVs uh, or the CHWs want for, for, for them. So I think the thing is making them understand what is happening in the community. A CHV is very powerful because, for example, in Nairobi, one CHV takes care of 100 households. So, for example, because we have 7,320 CHVs, they are in over 732 households. If you translate that in terms of votes, 
there are so many votes. And so eventually held will have a political milestone and the politicians and the government and whoever is able to support. But the trick is the executive to work together with the county assemblies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Judy. Dr. George, would you add on to what Dr. Judy has just said? If you had one piece of advice um, for counties or provinces or national ministries who are looking to take the first step towards P CHW payment, how, what would you advise them? Thank you. Uh, my advice is simple, but based on the understanding that uh, uh, universal health coverage can only be achieved if we go by what Uganda is trying to demonstrate now, that uh, there are two key delivery service platforms here. If you don't want to leave anybody behind, according to the universal health coverage big term, that leave nobody behind. In Uganda, we are trying to separate and say, let the facility-based service delivery platform end at Health Center 3. And so the next layer is the community-based service delivery platform, which is actually the delivery, sub, su delivery service platform that looks at household. When you enter the household, then you are able to count every member of the household and know each one by what kind of need, whether it is a social need, whether it is, um, is, is, is a health need for, for whatever reasons. And if you go by that, then it means the people you want to use as the health worker at that community service delivery platform deserve to be paid. And if they are to be paid, then they become part of the formal health system. Now, Uganda is a decentralized nation. And so all the activity of looking after those community health workers falls squarely under the local government. And so these people become uh, workers under the structure of local government, and so definitely become a uh, government employee. And that's the direction we are taking. If it works out, then it becomes uh, a lesson for other countries to pick up from. And that's my only advice, for people to keep their ears and eyes on the ground and look at how we are trying to evolve our community health system arrangement that becomes institutionalized and help the village health uh, team or community health workers to get paid. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Dr. George and Dr. Judy for that great advice. Uh, we have another question in the um, Q&A box and I'm gonna address this to Prossi. Um, the majority of CHWs around the world are women and the majority of CHWs around the world are unpaid. We all agree uh, CHW should be paid for their work. Um, one questioner, audience member asked, however, what motivates women to take up roles even though they're unpaid? What hopes do they have when they make this decision? As a mother, you can't see people are, are dying. We have to take care about them. Even in our houses, you can't just see it when there is need for help. For example, when it's, as, as I told me that I buy medicine daily, you can't just see it when your, your, your baby is dying. Even if it's not your, in your house, even in the community, even if they call at night, you have to go and check at them because I'm a mother. Even if I'm not paid, I have to take care about them as I've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Prasi. Um, this is the type of selflessness that we see uh, every day from CHWs around the world. Uh, and we saw particularly during the COVID pandemic where many community health workers were not only unpaid, but unprotected. Um, this is a cost that is too high uh, for women, particularly poor world women to bear. 
and uh, we're excited about this momentum towards CHW payment. Um, we see additional great questions coming in um, the chat, and uh, we'd love to answer them all. And we'll try to type as we as we move. Um, but we're going to move towards uh, a conclusion here. And I'm just going to ask a question uh, to Nelly, um, also from an audience member in Kenya, uh, that this webinar was obviously around CHW payment. And CHW payment is one of the hardest uh, pieces of legislation to get institutionalized um, as part of the larger process of CHW professionalization. But of course, um, we need, as we do that, to consider equity. How do we professionalize health workers, remunerate them appropriately without um, excluding, for example, illiterate women who have been serving their communities um, for a long time? How have you seen that work out in uh, the countries in which you've worked? Uh, thank you, Madeline. Um, context here, um, a lot of community health workers who will stay, who will volunteer, you know, from the depths of their heart, as, as I've seen in most countries, would be, you know, those who've retired or some women from the community who probably are not um, literate. And so, uh, you know, we've I've seen counties, for example, still um, take on these women, um, despite them being illiterate, as long as they are delivering on the job and they do have performance mechanisms that um, uh, to check that. So they are being compensated. So in that regard, then the whole equity question um, uh, is, is, is answered. But then the other aspect is the need for the multi-sectoral collaboration. As I pointed out, if we are to formalize this and institutionalize this, we then need to collaborate with the public service commission bodies in our respective countries. The other people who set the criteria, who is the minimum wage, um, what's the minimum wage, what's the minimum criteria of education and all those things. And this is where you advocate for community health workers because the truth is we cannot employ people who are really, really, really qualified and, uh, and, and, and literate. I've seen high attrition rates um, you know, with that end of the continuum. But what can be that uh, middle ground with this public service commission that would then be entrenched in their scheme of service that then allows for the legalization and institutionalization of these community health workers. Then that way we do not jeopardize or disenfranchise some of the illiterate women in the communities. Thank you, Nelly. Um, and thank you for that question, Julius. Uh, a final question before we move towards closing, and I'm going to pass it back to our uh, to Dr. Jen, to, to Jenny Schechter, the uh, CEO of Integrate Health, to answer this question and also close the panel. If you had five minutes with Samantha Power, what would you tell her about USAID approaches, particularly when it comes to community health? Thank you, Madeline. That is a great question. And just for anyone who might not know, Samantha Power is the um, director of USAID uh, at the US government under the current administration. Um, I think if I had five minutes, I wouldn't wanna bury the lead. And I would say, Samantha Power, we need you to use US government funds to help countries pay community health workers. Um, you know, that is what we were, are talking about here. and. As we know for too long, many funding institutions, including the US government have stood in the way of implementing policies such as these. We are very proud to see that that is changing. Um, and we are seeing this one, one piece of evidence is that the US government's um, presidential malaria initiative has recently announced that it will be using that funding, PMI funding, to support payment for community health workers in countries where PMI is working. So this is a big win. This is an incredible shift. We are seeing uh, this policy change and I would really encourage Ambassador Power to 
extend that policy through all USAID funding institutions and also use her platform to try to influence other funders, other bi and multilateral funding institutions to also change the way that um, we're incentivizing and supporting ministries of health to formalize and to institutionalize payment for CHWs. So thank you for that question. Um, we are just at about time for our session today. I want to thank you all so much for joining us. It has been absolutely incredible for me um, as the CEO of Integrate Health, supporting the, the Sante Integral, Integrate Health team in Togo, and also as an advisory board member of the Community Health Impact Coalition. It's just been incredible to see. We've had over 125 participants on the call today. Um, you all are our hope for taking these recommendations from this report and making them the changes that we need to see on the ground. Um, you all are the network of advocates and partners that can really make this possible. I especially want to thank all of the representatives from various ministries of health and other government entities who have joined us. You are our leaders and we look to you and we look to support you to help make these changes. Um, Carrie, maybe I'll ask you to just go ahead and pull up our very last slide. I wanna encourage everyone to continue to stay involved and to help us do this important work. There are a number of ways that you can join us. We have them up here on the screen. Um, please follow along and support the work of the Community Health Impact Coalition. And finally, we are going to um, share a very last poll just to get your feedback on our translation services that we were able to provide today. So if you could all please take a moment and answer that quick poll, um, we would really appreciate it. Thank you all, thank you for your time. Thank you for your courageous work around the world. We are deeply grateful. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.